All right, this is a new class. It's the first lesson, and the series is called What the Hell? And uh, I think it's a good title. It's pretty original. don't know if uh, many other churches or pastors had a series called What the Hell? And uh, it's going to be focusing basically on the negative side of Christianity and religion. Uh, going to deal with all kinds of garbage and nonsense, basically. There's uh, another series that will be taught concurrently, which is going to focus on the positive side of Christianity and things you need to know. And I'm going to call that the Grab Bag Series. Uh, Self-explanatory. Grab bag means just any topic. Uh, you can call it the Basic Series. I never really liked the term basics because it makes it sound like it's very basic and uh, childish. But there's nothing basic about it. It's doctrines that you need to know. It's foundation. I mean, you could call it the foundational series. Uh, you could call it the fundamentals uh, series. You could call it. Um, you could call it the basic series. Uh, I like calling it the grab bag series because it means just that. I'm picking out of the Bible various subjects and doctrines that I feel is necessary for each believer to know. So that's the grab bag series. But this series is the What the Hell series, and the titles will be uh, What the Hell is Wrong with Non-Face-to-Face -face Teaching, What the Hell is Wrong with Churches Today, uh, What the Hell is Wrong with Smoking, What the Hell is Wrong with Drinking, what the hell's wrong with overeating? What the hell's wrong with um, mankind, for instance? What's, what the hell's wrong with the media? And uh, what, what the hell's a legalist? What the hell's legalism? That's something we'll cover. Um, what, the, what the hell is, is up with tithing and other gimmicks that churches use? And what the hell is a pope? Anyways, the Pope, a uh, new Pope just got elected. What the hell is that about? So, and I, I like the word hell. You know, it's it's a nice word. Um, I use it quite a bit. In fact, uh, you know, I've told a person or two to go to hell, and people have told me to go to hell. And I like the word because it's really not even in the Bible. You know, it's it's kind of funny that how it's come about. The Greek word is Hades. H A D E S. And how they uh, take the word Hades from the Greek and come up with hell is beyond me. You know, a, a translation, a transliteration, usually it's pretty close to that word, but not in this case. And every now and then someone will try to be uh, nice, you know, on a hot, blustering day. They'll say, wow, it's as hot as Hades out today. Like somehow that's acceptable and it's not a bad word, even though they're taking the direct Greek word. But if someone were to come out and say, "Man, it's hot as hell today," you know, it just you know, it just shows again how stupid man is. Yeah. So I like to use the word hell because it's not even it's, it's a word where it's like, you know, how the hell did they come up with the word hell? You know, Hades. Why don't they just use Hades? or something close to it, but how they got hell, anyone's guess. So, the first class, which will be right now, is the topic, what the hell is wrong with non-face-to-face -face teaching? And the answer is nothing. But this is a good starter subject for me to, to expound upon, because it really chaps me personally. I've met a lot of pastors on the Internet and Christians and churchgoers on the Internet that tell me that I need to be in a church each Sunday, like I'm going to grow somehow uh, better in a, in a, sitting in a pew than listening to a, a tape at home or an MP3 or on the Internet at home. So that's the first subject. What the hell is wrong with non-face-to-face -face teaching? And I have 
heard all the arguments. Uh, there's nothing that you can, you know, write me or say that's going to make me say, oh, wow, you know, I, I never thought of that. You're right. It's, it's such a, a childish argument that it's really not even worth spending a, a lesson on, but I guess there are people that wonder, you know, do I need to find a church? Do I, you know, and there's a lot of churches not even teaching anything. You know, if one, they meet, they have class on Sunday, they call it Sunday school, and that's about it. Then their worship service is usually pretty corny, a lot of singing and announcements and maybe a 15 to 20 minute um, presentation on just a bunch of nonsense, you know, uh, real nice, lovey-dovey type stuff. Some churches maybe have a Sunday night class. Wednesday's not even a class anymore. It's usually it's supper or a prayer meeting, maybe a little message thrown in there. So how is anyone going to grow Sunday to Sunday? If you went to school as a child once or twice a week, it would take years to learn anything. You know, we go to school five days a week. We go to college five days a week. What's wrong with uh, learning the Bible five days a week or seven days a week? I mean, what's, what's more important? So these people that say that you need to get in a local assembly, and they, they take the verse of Hebrews 10.25 as their basis uh, a lot of times. <clears throat> and they, they shove this down my throat a lot. So we're going to look right now at Hebrews 10.25. So, if you've got a Bible, go ahead and let's open to Hebrews 10.25. And I'm one that, the way I like to teach, I like to read the verse. I guess another pet peeve I have is listening to a pastor and he'll give a doctrine or a principle and he'll say, and this is found in Romans 8.28, 1 Peter 5.3, 1 Corinthians 9.2, James 4.1. You know, I, I, don't, I don't like that. It's like, show me. Let's take the time to read the Bible because you can learn so much by just reading the verses. So, slow the pace down a little bit. <clears throat> so, if you got a Bible, open to Hebrews 10.25. And I'm sure, because you'll be listening to this on the Internet, so... um. I'm sure everyone has a Bible on their computer. But if, if not, or if you're too lazy to open it up, I'll just go ahead and read it to you. Hebrews 10.25 says this, and I'm reading out of the King James 2000 version, which is basically just a New King James translation, very similar. Hebrews 10.25, Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. So, you know, when you listen to that verse, you're like, wow, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is. So they'll say, oh, I mean, these pastors and Christians will say, oh, you, you don't want to assemble yourselves. Well, Hebrews 10.25 says so you need to assemble. Well, let's take a look at this verse. First off, you'll notice if you've got a King James, New King James, New American Standard, uh, translations that use italics, you'll notice the word one another is in italics. That basically means, you probably wondered, you've read the Bible, <clears throat> you probably wondered, why are some words in italics? You know, what's, what's that about? Is that emphasis or something? All that is, is that when it was translated from the Greek or the Hebrew, they would add some words in for clarity's sake. Now this was just man's, uh, the translator's attempt to make the verses more smooth or maybe to make the meaning uh, more profound or something. <clears throat> so that's, that's not inspired. That's just put in there. And if you have a Bible, uh, the New American Standard, the New King James, they'll even tell you that, that italics means it's not found in the original Greek. So it's nothing that I'm making up. You can just any Bible will tell you that. So let's, let's read Hebrews 10.25 without the italics. All right? Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhortation. And so the much more as you see the day approaching. 
Now, when you take one another out, exhorting one another, you would have to change that exhorting to exhortation because you're not exhorting yourself. Um, you're you're going so basically with the italics. It basically says you're going to church to exhort one another. Like, how in the hell are you going to do that? You know, how am I going to exhort? And what is it, what is exhortation? Basically, it means to learn. You know, that's what exhortation is. Uh, some pastors they'll say we're going to have an exhortation tonight in the doctrine of salvation or the doctrine of sin. And, and exhortation is a study. So, <clears throat> and I, I've heard pastors and people say, well. There may be a brother in the church that you might just say the right thing and they don't need to hear that, so you need to go for that. And, I, and I'm like, that's a bunch of crap, all right? If you can't find answers in the Word of God, nothing I'm going to say as a little side comment or a pep talk to you is going to make any difference. And with the uh, Internet and radio and television, um, it's it's just so there's so much out there. Someone wants to be encouraged, and they certainly can find a, a location or a means of encouragement if that's what they want, which is a bunch of nonsense. But if you take it, if you take one another out of this verse, all right, it says you go to church for exhortation. You go to church yourself to learn. Now the emphasis in this verse is not assembling yourselves but the emphasis is learning you don't you don't you know you don't go to church to assemble you go to there to learn and you got to you got to look in the isagogics of this verse as well isagogics means the interpretation of scripture in the time in which it was written and the time this was written there were no churches people met at homes uh, you read the book of Philemon that it talks about the church which meets in so-and-so's house. I forget the person's name offhand. but So, for a couple believers to get together in a house and someone teaches them class, what's wrong with that? I mean, where do these people get the, the notion that, oh, you must assemble yourselves in a church building? You know, I know a pastor likes a, a nice crowd to, you know, buffet his ego or he likes to just know that people are out there listening but it's it's a form of legalism really it's if you go to church to listen to the word of God or if you say I'll just get the tape or I'll just go to the internet and listen it's a choice and one of the arguments they say is well you don't have the self discipline you know when you're in church you have to pay attention you can't get up and get a bowl of cereal. You can't go to the fridge and get a beer. Um, no one's going to knock on your door, that kind of stuff. And my argument to that is, if you're positive to the Word of God, you're going to listen. It doesn't matter if you're in a church or if you're at home. If you want the Word of God, if you want to listen to it, you don't have to be in a setting where you're forced to listen. If you want the Word of God and positive to listen, you're going to listen. It doesn't matter if you're at home doesn't matter if you're sitting in a damn pew. It's stupid. I mean, it's, it's such a cornball, and, you know, teaching. And, it's, and you find so much of this crap. And I'm talking about churches that came out of bracket, pastors that got ordained out of bracket. They don't, they don't know better. I mean, they themselves were tapers. They grew up listening to Colonel Theme. They get ordained, and they get this half-baked idea that maybe because their church is so damn small... And they're so arrogant, they say, you, you must come here now. And pastors will say, you can only grow so far on tapes, and you have to get face-to-face. -face. It's a bunch of bull, you know what, it's a bunch of BS. I'll just say BS. Uh, I don't want to be that bold, but I know there's a, a church out in Oklahoma. They've got a web page. It's a pretty good-sized church. They've got a good... Uh, tape ministry and stuff, but they they used to cut your tapes off after a year. And it says plainly on their webpage, and this is a guy that got ordained from Baraka Church. He was in Baraka Church for a couple of years. Went out on his own, you know, certainly have gone, and he's gone far to the left. But it says on his webpage that tapes are a supplement and not a replacement of a pastor. 
and you, you must either start a local church or move to a local church. And like, this guy's an idiot, all right? So everybody serving in the military, you you have to basically get out of the military and move to uh, his church or, or move to a church that's teaching doctrine. Because let's face it, there's not many churches out there teaching doctrine, all right? I mean, there's churches on every corner uh, in America. But if you want a church that's going to teach you Bible doctrine, it's going to teach you no-nonsense doctrine, and especially on a consistent basis, uh, many times a week, it's not happening. Very, very few out there. So for this guy to say, and what's the point anyways, right? You got to say you got a great job and you're living in, um, let's say, Columbia, South Carolina. I don't know if there's any, I don't know any churches out there that are doctrinal. So let's say you're making good money in Columbia, South Carolina. You've got a nice house. You, you've been settled down there for a long time. Get saved. Start learning the Bible. And you stumble across this guy, and he says, well, you need to, you know, start a church or move to a church. Well, who's going to start a church? I mean, come on. That's, that's stupid. But to tell someone that you've got to just pack up all your belongings, quit your job, and move out, to Oklahoma so you can get face-to-face -face teaching. What a bunch of BS, all right? And if you listen to this guy, you'd be better, you'd be better just reading a commentary anyways. I have had the, the opportunity of face-to-face -face teaching on a couple of occasions. I used to live near Fort Wayne, Indiana, and Bill Polly, who pastored Grace Memorial Bible Church in Fort Wayne, Indiana for many years, back for like 24 years he was pastor there. Very excellent pastor. I have many of his lessons on tape. He died in 1996, but I, I went to his church a, a couple of times, and you know, it was fun, but it was no different than driving out there, sitting down and listening to him teach a class. It was no different than me sitting down putting a tape in the tape player, having my Bible open, taking notes, and listening. It's no different. And I've heard all these guys, uh, I've talked to some pastors on the Internet, even uh, my telephone, I've talked to a lot of Christians, and they'll tell me that nonsense you need face-to-face. -face. And there was another church that started up pretty close to uh, where I live, and I went out there a few times, and I was friends with a pastor, and I told him, I said, you know, this is... It's no, no different. It's no different driving out here listening to class or listening on the Internet. And it's like I said earlier, if you want to learn the Bible, if you want to learn Bible doctrine, if you're motivated to learn Bible doctrine, whatever your surrounding is is inconsequential. If you drive out and sit down on a pew or in a chair and the guy is in front of you in the flesh teaching you the Word of God, or if you're at a bar with a laptop, with some headphones plugged into that laptop, and on the Internet listening to this message, it's no damn difference. It's just legalism. It's nonsense. It's, it's really not even legalism. It's just BS. If you need a translation of what BS means, just email me, and I'll be glad to tell you, but I think you know what it means. It's just BS. What you need is the Word of God. And like I said in Hebrews 10.25, they met in homes. So if you met in a home and you had a guy come and teach you, or if you met in a home and you put on the tape player, what's the difference? I mean, that was a church when the, first, when the New Testament was, was being circulated. So in another verse they throw up, we'll look at 2 John, and I'll get it on my computer ready. 2 John 1.12. And this is another verse that they throw up that you need face to face. All right. Second John one twelve. John the Apostle writes this. Having many things to write you, I would not write with paper and ink, but I trust to come to you and to speak face to face, that our joy may be full. And they take this way out of context. They say, right there, see, our joy may be full if I teach face to face, meaning that this letter I sent you, it's, it's not going to be all that big of a deal. But when I come to you, boy, our joy is going to be full. But yet, God the Holy Spirit preserved this writing for us. 
And they also use another thing of John, uh, 3 John uh, one thirteen. So I'll put that on my screen. 3 John one thirteen. And it says this, I had many things to write, but I will not write with ink and pen. Uh, let's see, I, I read that wrong. I had many things to write, but I will not with ink and pen write unto you, but I trust I shall shortly see you and shall speak face to face. Peace to you. Our friends greet you. Greet the friends by name. And that's the end of the epistle. So they, they give this. But what, what they don't fail to understand is John just wrote this epistle. You know, he wrote a lot of stuff in this epistle. I mean, if you ever studied Third John, it's very short. It's packed. It's, it's got a lot of stuff. It's got, you know, one guy was arrogant. He tried to assert his authority and over the church and uh, wouldn't let John and other people, wouldn't let their letters come through to the church. So he wrote this letter to the people of the church saying, you know, this is uh, a lot of arrogance going on and I want to set things straight. And he went face to face to set things straight. It was more of a problem with the church. But the point is, if he put so much value on face to face, why even bother writing these messages? But to make my point more valid, let's see who else wrote and not taught face to face. Good old Luke. In Luke 1 3, Dr. Luke, he was a physician, he traveled with Paul, he wrote the book of Acts, and he also wrote the book of Luke, which bears his name. Luke 1 3 says this It seemed good to me also having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto you in order, most excellent Theophilus, that you might know the certainty of those things in which you have been instructed. So what Luke is saying, he's saying, I'm writing this to you. I mean, this, they, didn't, they didn't even have tapes back then. All they had was letters. So this guy Theophilus, who was a friend of Luke, saved this letter, and God the Holy Spirit preserved this letter, which is now called the Gospel according to Luke. But Luke didn't say, look, I'm going to come down to your house, I'm going to come down to your church, and I'm going to teach you these things that Jesus did. But he says, I, I write these things that you'll have a better understanding. I write them to you, non-face-to-face -face teaching. I mean, let's get that clear, all right? These bonehead pastors that say you need to get face-to-face -face teaching, they're just that, they're boneheads. Luke wrote non-face-to-face. -face. He didn't come out there and give them a face-to-face -face lecture. And it's preserved in the Bible. Another example is found in Jude. Good old Jude. Let's go to Jude 1, 3. Actually, there's only one chapter, but... All right, Jude says this. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was necessary for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. And, you know, then he goes on into his epistle. But he wrote. He didn't drive out on his chariot to this church and say, all right, I'm now going to give you some face-to-face -face teaching because you can't get it by letter, non-face-to-face. -face. But he wrote to them. He said, here's my writing. You know, read it. So some guy would stand up and read this letter. They didn't have a pastor that came out there and taught face-to-face, -face, but they read this letter from Jude. So it's, much, much, it's a bunch of crap. It's face-to-face -face nonsense. And it's nonsense. It's, it's a baby doctrine that I shouldn't even have to bother with. But it's the way it goes. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of churches that say the King James is the only Bible. Very baby 
principle and, and point, but it needs to be covered. And that's another topic for, in the What the Hell series. What the hell is up with these people that say the King James is the only Bible? But that's that's another lesson. Alright, now the great Apostle Paul. We're going to look at a lot of verses by the Apostle Paul. So let me pull that up on my Bible here on the computer. Hmm. Okay. Now, take in mind this. The Apostle Paul, of course, is considered, you know, like the greatest, smartest Apostle. He wrote uh, most of the New Testament. And he didn't have a church. He had no local church, all right? Everything he did, he would visit these churches and basically give them a conference, you know, but so often he would uh, he would write letters to churches. That's that's how he taught. He he would write letters and would send send them to these churches. Uh, he sent them to the church of Corinth. You have First and Second Corinthians. There's actually more that we know about. Uh, he wrote other letters, and God the Holy Spirit preserved a lot of these letters in the New Testament. But Paul did not have a church. He was not a pastor of a church where he had face to face teaching. He traveled around. In fact, he was in prison for a number of years where he wrote a lot of his epistles. He wrote uh, Ephesians, Colossians, Philippians, Philemon. He wrote it in jail. He was in prison. He didn't have any church. So these churches would get this letter from Paul and they would read that letter from Paul. They would, they would study that letter of Paul. They would teach that letter of Paul. So... Paul's ministry, the great Apostle Paul, was really a non-face-to-face -face ministry. He would visit churches. He would write them letters. He had no church that he um, pastored every day or you know every week. So here's what the great Apostle Paul wrote. And if it's good enough for Paul, it's good enough for me. Okay. If you've got your Bible, turn to 1 Corinthians 4.14. 1 Corinthians 4.14. And if you're too lazy, I'll just go ahead and read it to you. The great Apostle Paul says this, I write these things to shame you, but as my beloved sons, I warn you. Now again, he says, I write these things. I don't come out there and teach you face to face these things to uh, shame you, but I write these things. So if the Apostle Paul would write doctrines to people. What the hell is wrong with pastors today writing gospel tracts, writing books, writing publications, recording messages, recording tapes, getting on the radio, getting on television, getting on the internet, teaching the Word of God to people. And people are listening. What is wrong with that? It is just damn arrogance to say you have to go out to this church Sit your ass down in the pew and listen face to face. That's crap. That's nonsense. That's BS. Period. Now let's look at other verses. All right. First Corinthians. Stay in the same book. I'll, I'll go chronologically here in the Bible or however you want to call it, but we'll, it'll be a very simple format. First Corinthians fourteen thirty seven. If any man thinks himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. I write these things to you. I don't get out there and speak face to face to you. I write them to you. Now let's go to Second Corinthians. There's a lot of verses together, so I want to make my point valid. Second Corinthians one thirteen. For we write None other things unto you that you read or acknowledge, and I trust you shall acknowledge even to the end. And again, this is the verse taken out of context. I mean, you have no idea what he's talking about. But the point of this verse that I'm trying to make is, for I write none other things unto you. I don't travel out to your church and speak face to face to you. I'm not there. I write unto you this letter. I'll send it along with uh, somebody. He'll bring it to your church. You'll read this. 
It's not face to face. I'm the apostle. I'm the authority. You respect me. You listen to me. It's a message. Second Corinthians two nine, staying in the same book. Second Corinthians two nine. For to this end, and also did I write, that I might know the proof of you, whether you be obedient in all things. And again, Paul says, I write. I'm trying to make this point clear. I mean, already I've done it with these verses, but let's continue. Second Corinthians nine one. Second Corinthians nine one. For concerning the ministering to the saints, it is unnecessary for me to write to you. So what he was saying there, that's the verse actually that kind of doesn't really go with the point I'm trying to make. Uh, that one he's saying, you ought to know this stuff by now. So it's unnecessary for me to write to you to explain this again. But what he's saying is, I have to write to you, write to you again to explain this. But again, he's saying I have to write to you. I'm not coming out there to teach face to face to you. Are you not having to come to me to get face to face teaching? But I'm going to write this to you, even though I shouldn't have to. I got to write it again. Second Corinthians, thirteen two. Second Corinthians thirteen two. I told you before. And tell you again, as if I were present, the second time, and being absent now, I write to them who earlier have sinned, and to all others, that if I come again, I will not spare. So, he's basically saying, I wrote you before, I'm writing you now. And if I do come there, I'm going to chew some ass. I mean, these Corinthians, you, you really got to know the story about the Corinthians to understand this. I mean, they were really messed up. I mean, for being a doctrinal church, I mean, they were um, taking each other to court, suing over petty nonsense. Uh, one guy was having sex with his mother-in-law. He was bragging about it. And, um, like, the She's probably a hot babe or something and bragging about the point. And uh, they were getting drunk at the communion table. They took, they took communion instead of grape juice. They actually had little glasses of wine, and people would would uh, do a couple of shots of them, little glasses of wine. So Paul was pretty uh, teed off at these Corinthians. And he wrote in the second uh, epistle to chew some butt, but he, he said basically in this verse, 13.2, you know, if I come out there, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a lot harder than this letter. Let's finish off 2 Corinthians with uh, 13.10. 2 Corinthians 13.10. And again, the emphasis on these verses is non-face-to-face teaching and how it was valid by the apostles, how it was valid by God the Holy Spirit, and it's just pure arrogance for any man in the 21st century to come along and tell you that you need to get yourself into this church for face-to-face teaching. Now granted, you need someone to teach you Bible truths. That's... I, I, I agree with them on that. I mean, that's one of their points. But if you want someone to teach you the Bible, you don't need face-to-face, per se. You may enjoy it. You may have a church you go to. That's fine. But... Uh, if you want to learn the Bible, you certainly can get it by various means. And that's the point. Learning Bible doctrine. If you're motivated to learn Bible doctrine, I mean, you know, and you could be on death row. All right, let's say you're on death row. You know, you, you can't go to a local church. You can't start a local church on death row. And it, it has to apply to everybody or, or it doesn't apply at all. So, a guy on death row, according to these people that say you need face-to-face, according to them, you cannot grow to spiritual maturity. So, when you die and you're judged uh, at the, the judgment seat of Christ, according to them, God 
Uh, Jesus Christ would say, well, I'm sorry, you're on death row, you had no opportunity for faith-based teaching, therefore you're a loser for all eternity. I mean, you can just see the, the nonsense of that. Or someone, uh, say they're in a wheelchair, they're, they're just physically handicapped. Uh, it's very difficult for them, they're bedridden. Uh, they cannot get face-to-face. And of course these idiot pastors will say, well, in a case like that, then it's, it's different, you know. Uh, I'm like, oh, BS, you know, if it's different for these people, if these people can grow to spiritual maturity on death row or bedridden, then damn it, so can the person that's able to go to church but chooses to stay home and listen. I mean, it's just, it's crap. And I'm thinking, uh, I'm hoping that you get this point from this message. I hope you're not that stupid as a lot of these jackass pastors that tell you you need face-to-face teaching. I mean, it's a jackass point. They're jackasses. Period. Now let's go on to another verse that Paul wrote. The great apostle Paul. Galatians 1.20. The book of Galatians 1.20. Now these things which I write unto you, Behold, before God I lie not, or I'm not lying. Uh, again, that was Galatians 1.20. Notice Paul says, uh, I write, these things I write to you. I'm writing these things to you. It's a letter to you. It's a non-face-to-face teaching. I'm not coming out there and telling you these things. I'm writing these things to you. And he's not writing these things to this church only. He's writing them to us. Another thing that Paul wrote, Philippians 3.1. And again, we're going down in the chronological order of the Bible, the New Testament, the way it's organized. So it's, I'm making it easy for you. Philippians 3.1. Again, the Apostle Paul. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord to write these same things to you. To me, indeed, is not troublesome, but for you it is safe. Paul's saying, you know, I need to repeat these things to you. For me, it's not, I don't, I don't care to repeat them. It's not a trouble to me. But you need to learn these things again and again and again. But again, the emphasis that I'm making on this verse, I write these same things to you. I write them to you. I'm not coming out there and teaching you face-to-face. I'm not making you come out to see me in jail so I can teach you face-to-face in my prison cell. I'm writing these things to you. Again, if it's good enough for the Apostle Paul, then, you know, it's good enough for today, okay? Another one that the Apostle Paul wrote, 1 Thessalonians 4.9. And I'm giving you a lot of verses here. You know, why not? 1 Thessalonians 4.9. But concerning brotherly love, you need not that I write unto you that you yourselves are taught of God to love one another. Again, the emphasis that I'm making, it's not really the emphasis of the verse, but the emphasis is, I need not to write unto you again, implying, uh, I've written to you before. I, I've written a lot of stuff. And you ought to know this anyways. It's basically saying, it's, it, it, what I'm saying, it's a baby doctrine. You ought to know this. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.1. 1 Thessalonians 5.1. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, I have no need that I write unto you. And again, the Apostle Paul is saying, you know, you should know this. It's pretty simple. I don't need to write anything more to you. But the, the gist that I'm making is that he wrote to them before. Second Thessalonians now. Just going down. Second Thessalonians 3.17 The salutation of Paul with my own hand, which is a sign in every epistle, so I write. We could just say amen and close with that one, but let's keep going. 1 Timothy 3.14 1 Timothy 3.14 These things write I unto you, hoping to come unto you shortly. But he writes to them. Now let's see what else we got. Now we got Peter. Let's go to 2 Peter 3.1. The Apostle Peter now. We've had a lot of Paul, and we had some of Jude there and Luke. Let's see what Peter says. Let's get a good mix in here, right? 2 Peter 3.1. The second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you. 
in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance. Peter doesn't say, all right, the second epistle, I now come out and teach you face to face. He doesn't say the second epistle uh, that you now must, you know, drive out here and listen face to face. He wasn't that stupid. He wasn't stupid at all. Like these pastors that say you need face to face. But he says the second epistle, beloved, I now write. He taught uh, his listeners, his flock, by writing. So if it was good enough for the apostles, then by golly, it's good enough for us. Well, let's conclude with a few more verses. Book of Revelation, 111. Revelation 111. I am the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. What you see, write in a book, and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamon, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And this was Jesus Christ speaking. Now, Jesus Christ told John to write this in a book and send it out. These churches were going to receive a written letter. They weren't going to have John come out and give them a special message. They weren't going to go out to John and listen to him face to face. They said, write these. Write these things down and send it out. And these people learned by reading this book called Revelation, this epistle. You know, it's really a, a big epistle, if you want to call it that, but it's a book. You know, they, they read it. They learned. And there's a few more verses. There's Revelation 1.19. It says, Write these things which you have seen. Uh, Revelation 2.1, Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus, write. Revelation 2.8, Unto the angel of the... And really, angel, I should tell you a side comment, it's messenger. I mean, it's angelos in the Greek, which uh, means messengers. It's not It's not this angel, you know, from heaven that uh, is to the, Smyr- to the church of Smyrna. You know, I mean, it's not that mysterious nonsense, which you see in a lot of commentaries. And uh, some good Bible translations will correctly translate that. In fact, I, God's Word translation translates that correctly. I think the International Standard Version has it correctly translated. So there are translations out there, but so I'll, I'll read that correctly. Unto the messenger, which which meant that okay, this guy is going to take the me- this book, this epistle. He's going to take it to the Church of Smyrna. And that the whole the, the emphasis isn't even on that. So many people make such an emphasis. Oh, the angel going to Smyrna and the angel going to Ephesus. All that was was just a guy courier to the courier to the church of Smyrna. You know, he, he got a copy of Revelation he ran out to Smyrna. But anyways, the emphasis I'm trying to make is right. Revelation 2.12 to the messenger or the courier to the church of Pergamon, right. Revelation 2.18 to the messenger of the church of Thyatira, right. Revelation 3.1 Unto the messenger of the church of Sardis, write. Again, it's non face to face. They were to write this down, deliver it to that church, and they were to read it. They were going to grow and learn by reading. So come on. Uh, Revelation 3.7, Revelation 3.12. And 3.12 is a little bit different, but it says. Um, he that overcomes, I'll make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is the New Jerusalem. That one doesn't apply, so that's my mistake. I wasn't trying to make that point. Uh, Revelation 21.5, near the end of the whole Bible. And he sat upon the throne and said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he was getting pretty close to wrap up the book of Revelation and to conclude the whole Bible. And Jesus Christ told him, Write, write these things down. Jesus Christ did not tell the Apostle John, All right, go out now and teach face to face to these people because they can't learn any other way. He said, Write these things. And a pastor today 
can write a message. He could write a sermon, and he can mail it to you, and you could get it in the mailbox and read it, and you can grow by reading what this guy said. They grew by what the Apostle Paul wrote. They can grow by what Pastor so-and-so writes today. If it's accurate and doctrinal, you're going to grow by it. If you get on the Internet, and there's some doctrinal uh, churches on the Internet, there's actually quite a good number of them. You can read their materials. You can listen to their messages. You can download their messages and listen to it. And you can grow. And there's no... Uh, stigma to it. You can't grow only so far, and then, but, but face to face, you can grow a lot further. It's a bunch of just pure nonsense. So I conclude this message now with the question that I started with: What the hell is wrong with non-face to face teaching? And the answer is nothing. Let's pray, Heavenly Father. We pray now and thank you for this moment of uh, teaching, and hopefully, I taught the listeners clearly as best as I can that non-face-to-face teaching is legitimate and valid and one can learn and grow to spiritual maturity because the only issue in this life is to learn the Word of God, to learn the Word of God and apply it. It doesn't matter if you're face-to-face, it doesn't matter if you're on tapes or reading a book. So Father, thank you for this message. Challenge us in what we learned. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.